mierda! ¡Bonita! Okay, we'll start with this, an update to a story talked about here on the channel, how young unbeaten up-and-comer Jahan Ingram was advocating for his free agency from Mayweather Promotions. He wanted to be released, and he has been. He took to his social media saying, to all my supporters, the boxing community, the media, I am happy to announce my official separation from Mayweather Promotions. I have nothing but love and respect for Floyd and the whole MPTMT family. Floyd helped me start my professional boxing career, and I'm appreciative for his guidance. I would like to express all my thanks and gratitude to every single person and boxing platforms who supported me through this process and helped me by allowing me to speak and voice my opinions and concerns. All I want to do is fight and show you all my talent because I am Mr. Really Like That. Yours truly. Jahan Pretty Boy Ingram. Boxing insider Rick Glacier caught wind of the news and reacted to it by saying, Great news. The young fighter Jahan Ingram that was publicly asking for his release on Twitter over the last 10 days from Floyd and Leonard Ellerby has now officially been released by Mayweather Promotions in exchange for zero dollars and no strings attached. As we all know Rick Glacier has long forecasted not only Mayweather Promotions' demise and their ineptitude, but the PBC's demise as a whole and its ineptitude. So what does that bring the headcount to now? What's that? Three fighters from Mayweather Promotions that have left? About three, maybe more. What? Richardson Hitchens, Jaleel Hackett. They both went to Matchroom. Jahan Ingram. He can go to Top Rank. He can go to Matchroom. He can go to Golden Boy. We'll see where he winds up. Though what is perhaps the most telling departure in all of this. It's not Richardson Hitchens or Jaleel Hackett or even Jahan Ingram. It's the rumor that Leonard Ellerby may soon be leaving Mayweather Promotions as well. Rick Glacior stated, all a byproduct of the Al Heyman and PBC Problems website MayweatherPromotions.com is no longer functional. Fighters are fleeing Floyd. Plus rumors abound, Leonard Ellerby is leaving Floyd and a CEO of Mayweather Promotions to firmly plant his lips on Tank Davis. That's right. To Leonard Ellerby, loyalty has its bounds and Ellerby's jumping off that sinking ship. Now that, that's a lot more telling than any one or some fighters leaving a promotional outfit because fighters leave promoters all the time. But that Leonard Ellerby, the CEO of Mayweather Promotions is leaving, that tells you everything you need to know. And what's that? How can you hope to make a living as the CEO of a promotional company that isn't promoting anyone or anything. You lost your golden goose. You lost Javante Davis. You're not promoting his fights anymore. These other guys, these younger guys, they ain't worth no money. Not yet. You're not promoting them. So as a promoter, the CEO of a promotional company, how can you hope to make a living being a promoter or being with a promoter that doesn't promote? You can. So he's got to go because Mayweather Promotions' is lifeblood was the money that flowed through it through Al Heyman brokering deals with broadcasters, with Fox, with Showtime, but now you don't got them giving you money anymore and Amazon's not giving you anything. Mayweather promotions may cease to exist. Outlived and outlasted by what are Floyd Mayweather's titty boys. Oh, let's be honest. It's always a good time to see some titties. So with the number of fighters that are leaving both Mayweather promotions and the PBC, Al Heyman as a whole, how are they supposed to survive? How are they supposed to sustain? Who's gonna carry the banner? No, well, they still got Javante Davis. It's hard to imagine that he would go to Matchroom or Golden Boy or Top Rank. I mean, they've still got him. They've still got David Benavides. Yeah, for only one more fight. What do you mean for only one more fight? One more fight. At the beginning of last year, David Benavidez's father said they had just inked a three-fight deal with the PBC. An extension, I should say. And this was before he fought Caleb Plant.
We have a contract for three fights. We have uh, Boo Boo Andrade, we have Charlo, we have uh, uh, Devin Morrell. You know, uh, if, if everything goes well, then I'm pretty sure it's going to go well. So uh, I wouldn't sign that uh, uh, contract for 168 if I didn't think he was going to do 168. A few differences aside in terms of the names that David ended up fighting, David here and now is two fights in two that three fight deal. The Vajdik fight would have to be the final fight. The first fight was the Caleb Plant fight. The second fight was the Andre fight. And the third fight would have to be the Vajdik fight. The final fight of the deal. You're losing me. That when you think about what the PBC has left and whether or not it's enough to keep going, to go on. Well, they still have Javante, but they may not have David Benavidez after the Vajdik fight. The deal will be up and Samson Lukowicz might take him somewhere else. Maybe he takes him to Golden Boy. What about Spence? They've still got Spence. In regards to Errol Spence Jr., boxing insider Rick Lacier said, those thinking that Errol Spence has one last great fight left in him will see in reality Spence has nothing left in the tank. It's not the one loss, it's the sustained beating that Errol took over nine rounds at the vicious hands of Terence Crayford. That indicates Spence is now completely shot. Game's over. It can all come crashing down in one night, one fight, and it did for Errol Spence. This is the guy that's supposed to carry the PBC banner. That when you think about how many fighters are leaving the PBC, the TMT, and what fighters remain, what fighters they have left, you're gonna put it all on Errol. You can't. Errol Spence Jr. who tweeted, What? His next fight might be the last time that we see him. Errol Spence Jr. who recently stated, He doesn't have a trainer right now. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, definitely, I'm, I'm definitely gonna get in this year. Probably, probably October, November. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you gotta wait to hear from me. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm looking I'm looking for <laughs> I'm looking for a coach right now so <laughs> so yeah I got well, I got a few I got a few names in the hat you know I'm I'm out you know working with people and trying to see who I mess with and uh, I had some, <clears throat> some news real soon but I try you know I try to stay low as possible even before Terence Crawford laid a glove on this guy and even before his car accident in 2019 I stated right here on this channel that I don't like Errol's chances at 154 against those fighters that are up there because while he might be a decent sized welterweight he won't be a decent sized junior middle he'll be on the smaller end of the spectrum and the fact that he couldn't stop Mikey Garcia a blown up lightweight who moved up in weight having no prior experience at welter that Errol couldn't knock him out out. Couldn't even knock him down. Given Errol Spence Jr.'s aggressive approach that Errol Spence is quite busy within a round, throwing punches and bunches and going to the body, that he couldn't knock Mikey out, that he couldn't even knock Mikey down. Based on that, I didn't like his chances at 154. Add on everything else, the car accident, the Crawford fight, the amount of time he's been away from the ring because he's supposed to be coming back against Sebastian Fundora later on this year, and when he does, it will have been over a year's time since his last fight. No, oh, I don't get the sense Errol has that much more left to give to the sport of boxing, let alone being the one that can carry the PBC banner so that they can carry on. They all seem to be on borrowed time. So when I think about how many fighters are leaving versus what fighters they have left, I'd be surprised if they survived beyond this year. I would, because even if some wealthy investor stepped in and saved them and made an investment, what would he be investing in? There isn't much left. Telltale sign of a promotional outfit's health is their ability to take on new fighters, young unbeaten up-and-comers, young unbeaten fighters, and the PBC's unbeaten fighters are leaving. Richardson Hitchens, Jaleel Hackett, more recently Johan Ingram, Brandon Lee, Vito Milnicki. The list goes on because it's more than that. It's a lot more than that. They're on borrowed time. Elsewhere in the world of boxing, boxing scribe Mike Kopinger tweets, A Manny Pacquiao versus Mario Barrios WBC welterweight title fight is being explored for this fall in Vegas. Manny Pacquiao Promotions president Sean Gibbons told ESPN, I made history at 40 beating Keith Thurman, and I feel at 45 I have a lot left in the game as I haven't taken a lot of punishment over the last few years. Pacquiao told ESPN, I want to go out making history. You already went out. Sounds more like Manny's political career did not go as planned. 
the well is running dry. He's running out of money. Thus, he must do the only thing he knows how to do, the only thing he can do, and that's fight. Keep fighting. What are Manny Pacquiao's chances against today's Mario Barrios? In truth, I actually give a 45-year-old Manny Pacquiao a fighting chance against that fighter because that fighter has never competed on the same level as a Manny Pacquiao. They are not cut from the same cloth. Manny Pacquiao sports professional record of 62 wins with eight losses, two draws, 39 knockouts, having been knocked out three times. Just three in 72 professional contests to Mario Barrios. Sports professional record of 29 wins with two losses, no draws, 18 knockouts, having been knocked out once, just once in 31 professional bouts. Last in action earlier this year in May on the undercard of Canelo versus Munguia opposite the ring, Fabian Maidana. And based on what I saw in the Fabian Maidana fight, yeah, I'd give Manny Pacquiao a fighting chance to beat Mario Barrios. He didn't look nothing special in that fight. Being honest with you, he's never really looked nothing special. Sure, he beat Ugas and Ugas beat Manny. But triangle theories don't work. And context is key. When Ugas beat Manny Pacquiao, Manny hadn't fought in two years. So he had a lot of inactivity. A lot of ring rust. And Ugas wasn't who he was training for. Remember, Ugas was standing in for Errol Spence Jr. Originally, it was supposed to be Pacquiao versus suspense but spence suffered an injury to his eye and ugas took his place that might have thrown many off a year mario barrios beat ugas but that wasn't until after spence beat ugas remember spence beats ugas ugas sits out for a year comes back then he loses to barrios context is key I think these are the right circumstances for Manny Pacquiao to come back against a guy and win a belt. A full belt. A full title. Because if Manny's thinking about coming back... Ain't Barrios WBC interim champion? He is. And if they make this fight between Manny and Mario... Terrence still has the WBC title. But not for long. It won't be long before he drops it. If he does, that title could be on the line in this fight. Who's gonna promote it? Well, Manny Pacquiao does have his own promotional company, Manny Pacquiao Promotions. Yeah, but Manny Pacquiao Promotions doesn't have a broadcaster. They don't have a broadcast deal. They don't have a deal with Amazon or DAZN or ESPN or somebody. Manny Pacquiao Promotions doesn't do their own shows. Manny Pacquiao Promotions' as fighters have been fighting under the PBC umbrella. So there's a feeling that Okay, somebody's got to promote this thing. Somebody's got to pour money into it, pay the fighters and their guarantees, and do the undercard. So that's a question that needs an answer. Who's going to promote the show? Who's going to pay to make it happen? We've known that Manny Pacquiao has been trying to come back for a while now. For at least a year, there were rumors and rumblings about a potential Conor Ben fight. Now we're hearing about this, that Manny hasn't quite called it a career. Not yet, even though Manny hasn't fought in about three years, close to it. It will have been three years in August. Since the last time he saw action was in August of 2021, opposite the ring late replacement, your Denis Lugos. Why'd you add an L to his name? Am I excited to see a 45-year-old Manny Pacquiao go in there with Mario Barrios? No, not really. But there is a skills gap there, an experience gap, an ability gap there. Even though Manny's older, a lot older than Mario Barrios, Mario's still a way better fighter than Mario ever was, and ever will be. This looks like a tune-up fight for Manny. When you think about the fighters that Manny Pacquiao has fought, and the fighters that Manny Pacquiao has beat, and how Mario stacks up with those fighters, oh, well, he would be a tune-up fight. Even better if they can make it for a title. Mildly intriguing fight. Three-star fight. It's a solid fight. What? It's a solid fight. The victory is up for grabs. Elsewhere in the world of boxing, Ryan Garcia took to his social media and stated, Still no payment, Golden Boy Promotions and DAZN, to which Devin Haney responded, Same. Devin Haney, who stated, Oscar's bitch ass ain't answered the phone for weeks. Bitch, I'm calling about my money. Golden Boy stiffed him on the doll? Not according to Boxing Insider, Rick Glacier. Boxing Insider, Rick Glacier said, there are tweets by Ryan Garcia and Devin Haney saying they haven't been paid for their fight of April 20th by Golden Boy and DAZN. Here are the real facts. Per their respective pay-per-view contracts, 
They were already paid their respective guarantees per the contracts. The money the two fighters are referring to is their respective pay-per-view proceeds. I'm told, contractually, Golden Boy Promotions and DAZN have a 60 to 90 day clause to pay the fighters their respective pay-per-view proceeds. So far, only 49 days have lapsed since April 20th. Fighters really need to understand exactly what they sign. Believe this, Ryan Garcia and Devin Haney will be paid in stipulation and in compliance with their bout agreements they both signed. Thank you. You believe that? Yeah, because it's been common knowledge for years that the guarantee is what you get up front and the rest comes in over time. You don't get it all right away. Perhaps that's why in more recent years there's been a lot more emphasis on what the fighter gets up front, what they're gonna be paid straight away versus what else they stand to make from the back end money. The upside of a pay-per-view. If there even is one. You see, when fighters ask for very big guarantees, a lot of money up front to do a fight, the fight is that much more risky to put on for the promoter because you're spending so much already now it has to sell because of what it's already costed you to put it together whereas a nominal guarantee a smaller guarantee and allowing the fighter to get the rest of their money from the pay-per-views upside is a lot less risky for the promoter and the platform because putting the show together wasn't as expensive the fighter still has the opportunity to make money make more money but it'll come from the pay-per-views upside and not the promoter in the platform's pocket. What? The best example of this are the first two Wilder vs. Fury fights. Now, the first Wilder vs. Fury fight didn't cost that much to put on. That's why that was a success and not a flop. Why? Because the guarantees to the fighters, both fighters, was only about $7 million, $4 million to Wilder, about $3 million to Fury. Something like that. So when the pay-per-view ends up selling over 300,000 pay-per-view buys, well, you're in the plus. You're in the black because the fight didn't cost you that much to put on. Now, the second fight, they overshot it. They grossly overshot it. They guaranteed to both of these guys somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 million dollars between them. That's up from seven. That's what they spent on guarantees, which means in order to clear those guarantees and get back what you put in, this pay-per-view's got to sell well in excess of a million pay-per-view buys. The problem? is it didn't. So it flopped. So when you hear that a pay-per-view flopped, it's because they didn't make back the operational costs. They didn't get back what they put in. They overshot it. So when you're guaranteeing fighters big cash guarantees, that's the risk you're running. It's less risky to offer the fighters nominal guarantees, nominal money up front, and you can make the rest from the upside if there is an upside. Did Ryan and Devin's pay-per-view flop? No, that's not what I heard. I heard it did all right. I heard it did somewhere in the neighborhood of 500,000 pay-per-view buys. Then why haven't they been paid yet? They have been paid. They've been paid their guarantees. What they're waiting for is the upside money. Well, what's taking the upside money so long? This was a Golden Boy promotion, you know. It wasn't a matchroom show. That matters too. We'll see what happens.